This is not normal President Donald Trump's administration is transforming the EPA, from wiping out mentions of climate change to rolling back regulations that protect Americans from pollution. Four new revelations about the inner workings of the agency came to light this past weekend. Shameless censorship without explanation, the EPA prevented two of its scientists from speaking about their climate change research at a conference about protecting a Rhode Island estuary. Even more censorship, the EPA removed 15 mentions of climate change from a site meant to help local governments address, well, climate change. Health risks ignored the New York Times published internal emails showing that a top Trump appointee, Nancy B. Beck formerly an executive at a chemical trade association, demanded the agency rewrite a rule to make it harder to track the health consequences of a controversial pesticide, chlorpyrifos. Refusal to speak to the press The EPA declined the Times' requests to comment on that investigation, though a spokesperson wrote to the paper, saying no matter how much information we give you, you would never write a fair piece. The only thing inappropriate and biased is your continued fixation on writing elitist clickbait trying to attack qualified professionals committed to serving their country. Hurricane Maria On Tuesday afternoon, 34 days after the hurricane made landfall in Puerto Rico, the National Weather Service in San Juan posted an unassuming YouTube link to their Twitter account. I've never seen anything like it posted by the National Weather Service before the video is an 11-minute tour of the island, complete with drone flyovers and somber piano music. It shows the enormous scale of one of the worst humanitarian disasters in U.S. history, as thousands of people continue to struggle for survival. There's footage from all corners of the island, showing washed-out bridges, flattened homes, and broken infrastructure. The camera flies over a wind farm in Naguabo and a solar farm in Macau, both destroyed in the storm. In nearly every shot there are twisted trees, stripped of their leaves. Though this video was intended as a visual chronicle to accompany a meteorological report, it's striking on its own. Pick up the tab The U.S. federal government has spent $350 billion on extreme weather-related events in the past 10 years, and it can expect to spend even more in the next decade. A bipartisan report from the Government Accountability Office GAO says climate change will continue to increase the frequency and intensity of rare weather events. The report used research from multiple government agencies to estimate that taxpayers will have to fork over an extra $35 billion per year by mid-century and $112 billion per year later this century, in climate-related costs, that's on top of what we're currently spending. The GAO findings carry extra weight since the office is known for conservative estimates on polarizing issues. The federal government has already provided $15 billion in disaster aid this year, and the Senate approved an additional $36.5 billion in aid on Tuesday. The link between climate and extreme weather disasters ISNT lost on the American public. In light of this year's devastating hurricane and wildfire season, more people are connecting the dots. Bank shot the demonstrations call on households, cities, and institutions to withdraw money from banks financing projects that activists say violate human rights, such as the Dakota Access Pipeline and efforts to extract oil from tar sands in Alberta, Canada. The divestment campaign Mazoska Talks, which is using the hashtag Divest the Globe, began with protests across the United States on Monday and continues with actions in Africa, Asia, and Europe on Tuesday and Wednesday. Seven people were arrested in Seattle yesterday, where activists briefly shut down a Bank of America, Chase, and Wells Fargo. The demonstrations coincide with a meeting in Sao Paulo, Brazil, involving a group of financial institutions that have established a framework for assessing the environmental and social risks of development projects. Organizers allege the banks have failed to uphold indigenous peoples' right to free, prior, and informed consent to projects developed on their land. We want the global financial community to realize that investing in projects that harm us is really investing in death, genocide, racism, and does have a direct effect on not only us on the front lines but every person on this planet, Joy Braun, an indigenous environmental network community organizer, said in a statement, Manhattan on the Rock's superstorm Sandy was 1,000 miles wide, the largest hurricane ever recorded in the Atlantic, and produced the worst flood in New York City history when it hit five years ago this week. Since then, the city has spent billions upgrading infrastructure and preparing for the next big hurricane. But in the coming decades, the city could see this kind of flooding on a routine basis. According to a new study out Monday, sea level rise could lead to Sandy Lake flood events every five years starting around mid-century. The study, written by some of the world's most renowned experts on hurricanes and Antarctica's melting ice sheet, provides fresh evidence that sea level rise will dominate New York City's future, overwhelming any effect from the changing frequency or intensity of storms.
There is no doubt that rising seas are already boosting big coastal floods, a threat that's poised to get worse. Because of enormous glaciers melting in Antarctica and Greenland, sea level rise is already locked in for centuries, and can only be avoided by rapid climate action. Failing that, New York City, founded nearly 400 years ago, probably has fewer than 400 years left. Deja Vu King County contains multitudes, including the city of Seattle, the widely despised website Amazon.com, the widely beloved website Grist.org, Ben Gibbard, and now, maybe a new coal mine. In 2011, the Pacific Coast Coal Company first filed a proposal to reopen the John Henry Mine, a small, long-dormant coal mine near the town of Black Diamond in southeastern King County. That year, the proposal was placed on administrative delay pending an environmental assessment. In 2014, a number of environmentalists led by Fuse Washington protested the project, and the delay was renewed again in 2016. But now that environmental assessment is complete, courtesy of the U.S. Department of the Interior, its findings that the John Henry Mine should have no significant impact on the surrounding area. I'm leaving aside for the moment how likely that is, let's just note that the Pacific Coast Coal Company has not engaged in any mining activity since 1999, and the state of Washington currently has zero active coal mines. The Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement has not yet issued a permit to reopen the mine, as it still needs to review the public comments, but the entire proposition feels extremely retro. Thinking about buying the new iPhone watch our video on how to repair your old phone instead.